so are you Jason, like the Jason who created Crash Bandicoot? I'm one of the Jason Rubens, there's a lot of people with my name, but I'm the one that did Crash Bandicoot. Awesome. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing just fine. What about you? Good. Steve's uh, talked about you a lot. He said that you would ask him some questions and he didn't think he had the ability to answer them. So he said, would I do it? So I figured, why not? Cool. So you play a lot of video games? Are you uh, making video games? I, I, I don't know. Uh, what, are you, what are you doing? Well, I make books. I make Bob and Willie books. And I, I'm selling one on Amazon right now. Oh, great. How's, uh, how's that going? Well, right now we're low on customers. I'm trying to get popular on YouTube so we can get more customers. Yeah. It's hard to get started, I tell you. The first game that I made, uh, I think we sold about a thousand copies. It was nothing. And it took a while until I finally got one that people started playing. And then, once you've made a hit, it's much easier with everything you do after that, because people are expecting it to be great. It's a lot of pressure, but it's a lot better once you've had a hit. So you just kind of got to keep going at it until it happens. It's a numbers game. The more things you do, the more attention you pay to those things, the more you kind of create stuff, one of them eventually will hit. And once it hits, you never have to do that work again because people already are looking for what you're doing. Thanks. Is that Steve? Hey, guys. Hey, sorry about that. So it sounds like you guys got started? Yeah, we already started talking. Fantastic. Hey, so just real quick, so Gunnar... Uh, you know, you had so many questions, I didn't know what to do, so I did the next best thing, which was to get Jason himself to talk with you. Hopefully that's okay. Sure, why not? Alright, Jason, my first question to you is, how did you meet Andy and start your first company, Jam? We, uh, we were in school together. We were actually quite young. We were about 12 when we met, and, uh, we didn't really pay that much attention to class, but what we did do is <laughs> sit around and talk about programming. And at the time, uh, he really couldn't learn from books. There was nothing on, there was no online. I mean, there was, this was before the web. So you, you learned how to program by doing it, and you learned how to program by talking to people who knew how to do it. And so Andy and I would spend an unbelievable amount of time just talking about programming. And we very quickly became friends. And uh, in those days, one person could make a full game. It was no big deal. I mean, I guess it's the same now for a, a mobile game. But back then, all games were made by one person, maybe two people. Um, so we were all making our own games. And after a while, I made one called Ski Craze, uh, which was a skiing game. And it was uh, it looked good, but it, it was very, very slow. I wasn't a great programmer. And uh, Andy was a better programmer, not a great artist. His games were all very fast and slick, but they looked terrible. <laughs> so we decided to pair up, and he fixed my code. My code was terrible. Uh, I think the farther down the mountain you got in the skiing, the slower the mountain went. So it was a problem. <laughs> and so he fixed that, and, and that game, actually, uh, a publisher picked up and sold. You didn't have, you know, again, without the Internet, you didn't have the opportunity that you have now with e-books or going to the Apple Store uh, and selling an app. So we got picked up, and someone sold it. And I, I was saying earlier, I think we sold a 1,000 copies very small, um, but that was a massive hit. We were 15 years old for us. That was incredible. <laughs> it gave us enough money to buy a lot of video games. So we decided to keep making them, and you know, you keep going and going, and you get better and better at it. And uh, you know, by the time we were 24, so about 10 years later, uh, we made a Crash Bandicoot game, which you know ended up being one of the biggest sellers of that period. So it really is all just do what you love over and over and over again until you get it right. Um, and if you find somebody that does something better than you, that's great. You know, join up with that person, have them what they do what they do well, and you do something else. You know, think of it like a, a rock band. Somebody's going to be a great singer, somebody's going to be a great guitarist, but without each other, they're nothing. Uh, and that's that's kind of how Andy and I always looked at it. And eventually, we hired people that were more talented animators than I was an animator. And we even hired people that were better programmers in some ways than Andy. So, you know, always look out for people that are really good to join up with because partnership is really, really helpful. You don't have to go alone. Now that sounds cool. All right, my next question is, what came from the idea of Crash? Um, well, we had, uh, we had come across this idea that there were all these holes in the industry. 
other words, a lot of people focused on doing the same thing. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out something that people like, but other people weren't doing. So for example, everyone loved fighting games. And when the 3DO came out, which was kind of a hardware that came out before the PlayStation, we said, well, there aren't any fighting games on the PlayStation, on the 3DO, sorry. So we did a fighting game, and sure enough, we were successful because we knew everyone wanted fighting games, but there weren't any other, other opportunities. So after that fighting game, we were uh, hired by Universal Studios in LA, and we, we were driving out from Boston. And we, uh, we were thinking, okay, well that was really successful, so now what can we do that no one else is doing? And obviously, there were a lot of character action games like Mario and Sonic, and they were amazing games, and clearly people loved them. But there was this new hardware coming out called the PlayStation that no one thought would succeed. Everyone thought it was gonna fail, because of course Nintendo and Sega were so much better at making games and all Sony made was Walkman. And we realized that nobody was going to make a character for that game in the system, right? No one was making that kind of game. So we thought, okay, well, Nintendo has Mario and Sega has Sonic. We're going to make a game for the PlayStation and it will be a character game. And he has to be fuzzy and cute because that's what seems to work. And so we started thinking about it. Um, and that's how we decided to make that kind of game. We figured if we were the only one out there and we were good, and everybody that wanted Mario but was on a PlayStation would buy the game, would love the game. So then we started thinking, okay, but the PlayStation is really powerful. So instead of doing a side-scrolling game like the early Sonics or the early Marios, let's turn it into 3D. And uh, we started talking about what that would look like. And we didn't want a big open world where you could run around and do anything because we didn't think platform games were all based on really you know, intricate, delicate skills of jumping a certain distance and timing and and, and they had really kind of, over years, gotten better and better at challenging people with that. We didn't want to give that up. So we took the screen that was sideways and we just kind of rotated it into the screen 90 degrees. And we realized that you would be looking at the back of your character all the time. So we called it uh, Sonic's Ass. That's what we called the game in our heads. And we then set out to make a character and make a game you know, where the character ran into the screen so that the game would play like a side-scroller, but it had 3D. Um, and sure enough, Miyamoto-san made uh, Mario 64, which was free roaming, and he did very well with it. Naka-san, who was one of the creators of Sonic, uh, was so scared about making a 3D game with, with Sonic that he instead made a game called Knights, which wasn't terribly well received by people. And we made the only character action game available early on on the PlayStation, the first big one, and that was Crash. And when Sony saw it, they agreed. This is a hole that we should have filled, but we didn't. You're the only one out there, and it's really good. So Sony decided to kind of make it into their mascot. And so it was a decision not only what kind of game we wanted to make, but also a decision of what kind of game we thought people uh, would come to because it was filling a hole, a gap, um, that people would like to fill with a title. And that, that always is how we've thought about things. Clever planning. All right, my third question is, when you were making Crash, do you got some of your ideas from Mario and Sonic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and we're not shy about saying that. We don't think it's a bad thing to take inspiration from, from great works that have come before you. I mean, that's what science is. Science is somebody invented the wheel, I'm going to put it on an axle, and then I'm going to put a box on it, and I'm going to put two arms on it, and that's going to be a wheelbarrow, and then someone else comes up with an engine, and you put that on four wheels, and it becomes a car. So there's no reason that, that creating entertainment shouldn't be the same. You look at what people before you have done, and you say, that was really good, and you get inspired by it. And we absolutely were huge fans of all the Mario games, all the Sonic games, um, and especially Donkey Kong Country, actually. Crash is probably, from a gameplay standpoint, closer to Donkey Kong Country than either of the other games. But it's very important when you do that to also create something unique and new. If all you're doing is copying, then that's not being inspired, that's copying. You have to figure out a way to take the best of something that's been done and then add something that's unique to it so that it's something new and special. And if you do that, people generally like it because they're familiar with the previous games or the previous whatever it is that you, you, were, you were building on. And yet they could say, this is new and interesting, so it's worth spending my time. Same is true of books. You know, there, there are a lot of books out there, and you can certainly be a new author of a book and be inspired by somebody who's written a book before. Um, 
so long as you're not copying them, they should be honored by that. You know, and anyone that copied Crash or Jack or anything going forward, and there certainly were people that, that took inspiration from it, I always thought that was a good thing. It says, hey, you did something special, you did something good, and I'd like to borrow that, and I'd like to make it better. And as long as they weren't copying us outright, I always thought it was a good thing. Hmm, nice. I'll have to try that myself. Now, who was the artist who made the Crash characters? I mean, I never get bored looking at these characters. They look incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Crash was made by a lot of people. Uh, there were three principal artists working on the character. I can't draw, so I was not one of those artists. The three artists were Charles Zembalis and Joe Pearson, who actually were not video game makers. They were cartoon animators who had made uh, a bunch of Disney uh, television animated series created a bunch of other characters. And the third person that drew Crash was named Bob Raffi. He was a naughty dog, and he is a video game maker still. And I kind of guided the process. It was, it was kind of like breeding pictures. I would say, here's some ideas, and they would all go draw them. And I would say, you know what? I really like the way that the shape of that character is, but I like the way that the legs on this character work. And I really like the nose on that character, and he probably shouldn't be bare feet, and he should be this, and he should be that. And so we'd make another bunch of sketches, and we'd say, okay, well, wow, that is a really good-looking face, but I hate the way the legs turned out. So take the legs from this one. And eventually, over time, you breed those looks down, and you come up with something that you really like. And the final sketch of Crash Bandicoot, which we consider the first true Crash Bandicoot, uh, was drawn by Charles Zembalis, and there are three images that he drew that same day of the same character, and they're all hanging still in Andy's house uh, frame. <laughs> I have the first three Dr. Cortexes on my wall, because I always <laughs> was more the Dr. Cortex, and he was always more the Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> so we both have the original sketches, and all of those original sketches were drawn by Charles Zembalis. He had an absolutely amazing hand. He has the uncanny ability to make the characters really look cool. And then we took those characters and we tried to make them in the 3D. Very good. It sounds like you did a lot with these characters. It took months, by the way. Months to create Crash Bandicoot. And even longer to name him. No wonder they look so good. Yeah, it really takes a while. Most games we start, we, we create this character called a blockhead. Which is literally a character that has a, a box as a head. No character at all. And you get the game to play well with the blockhead. And then you say to yourself, okay, now we know how the game's going to play. What type of character would work in this situation? You don't want a long, spindly guy if he's going to be like a tank kind of character. You want, uh, you know, a shorter, wider guy. If it's a really fast running character, you probably want thinner legs. You probably want, you know, a different look to him. So it's often useful to start with what the character's going to do and then get into what the character actually looks like. But it's still an incredibly hard challenge to come up with a character that you think is going to work.